If you find these videos helpful, you can come and support us on Patreon. You can gain access to ad-free content, as well as more tests. Your support is appreciated. This part of the test will measure your ability to understand academic passages in English. You can take notes while reading, and you will be able to answer the questions in any order you want. You can skip a question and then return to it later. Most of the questions are worth one point, but the last question in each passage will be worth more than one point.
This part of the test will measure your listening ability when it comes to the conversations and lectures in academic settings. You will listen to a recording and then answer questions about it. You will be able to take notes while listening and you can listen to the recording only once. The questions must be answered in the presented order. During the exam, you will not be allowed to go back to the previous question. The questions will be about the main idea and the supporting details. Some questions will be about the speaker's purpose or attitude. Answer the questions based on what is stated or implied by the speaker. Sometimes you will see this icon. It means that you will have to listen to a certain segment of the recording and answer a question about it. Now listen to the lecture. We shall examine the intriguing development of human language. Although our knowledge of this complicated subject is still developing, we have learned a lot about how languages have changed and diversified over time. There is ongoing discussion regarding the origins of human language. While some experts contend that speech developed independently of language, others contend that speech developed from gestures. The natural world provides evidence for this argument as certain animals communicate using vocalizations and gestures, indicating that one or both of these communication methods may have contributed to the development of language. The demand for effective communication increased as human cultures expanded. Humans started making more complex tools and participating in intricate social activities around 50,000 years ago, which required the use of increasingly sophisticated language. Our ancestors probably began using abstract symbols during this time, enabling them to communicate feelings, discuss abstract ideas, and tell stories. These ancient tongues served as the forerunners of the contemporary linguistic diversity we now observe. The development of language was further influenced by advances in agriculture. As farming techniques developed, Human populations grew more established and regional dialects began to take shape. These dialects subsequently split and developed into separate languages. Physical barriers like mountains and oceans that divided communities from one another frequently sparked this diversity. The development of languages has also been significantly influenced by historical occurrences. Languages were merged and words, grammar, and phonetics were borrowed as a result of massive migrations and trade networks. For instance, despite being a Germanic language, English has incorporated several words from Latin and French. It's obvious that technology is rapidly altering how we communicate in the modern world. Emojis, internet slang, and truncated text are some of the new language phenomena that have emerged in the digital age. We should continue to be interested in languages' growth as it adapts and changes in the future. What is the main idea of the lecture? In the lecture, the professor implies that How does the professor feel when discussing the digital age's impact on language?
What does the professor mean when this was said? For instance, despite being a Germanic language, English has incorporated several words from Latin and French. Why does the professor mention that certain animals use vocalizations and gestures to communicate? Which of the following elements were discussed as part of the evolution of human language, and which were not? Now listen to the conversation between two people. Hi, I'm interested in learning more about the scholarship and financial aid opportunities available at the university. Hello, we have a range of scholarships and financial aid programs for students based on their academic achievements, financial circumstances, and extracurricular activities. That's great news. How can I find out which scholarships and financial aid programs I might be eligible for? First, you should complete the application for student aid to determine your eligibility for federal aid. After that, you can visit our university website to find information about specific scholarships and grants. I understand there's a deadline for submitting it. Could you tell me when it is? The deadline can vary by state, but generally speaking, it's a good idea to submit it as soon as possible after October 1st to increase your chances of receiving aid. There are so many options and requirements to consider. I feel a bit lost. Is there someone I can consult for guidance on choosing the most suitable financial aid package for my situation? Of course. Our financial aid office has counselors who are ready to help students navigate the process and determine the best financial aid package based on their individual needs. What is the main idea of the dialogue? How does the student feel when discussing the options and requirements? What is the administrator's attitude toward helping the student with their concerns?
What is the administrator implying when they suggest submitting for financial aid, as soon as possible after October 1st? Which resource does the administrator recommend the student to consult, for specific scholarships and grants? Now listen to the lecture. Venus has long captivated both scientists and the general public because it is our neighboring planet. Today we'll explore how this fascinating universe came to be, as well as some of its unique features. The solar nebula, a cloud of gas and dust that existed about 4.6 billion years ago, can be used to determine the beginnings of Venus, as with all the other planets in our solar system. The Sun and the planets that orbit it were formed throughout time from this solar nebula. Venus, the second planet from the Sun, was finally created as a result of gravitational forces and particle collisions. Let's now concentrate on some distinctive qualities of Venus. Venus is only a little smaller than Earth in size, having a diameter of 12,104 kilometers. It has a cloud cover of sulfuric acid droplets and a dense atmosphere primarily made of carbon dioxide. The surface of the planet is mostly flat, made up of volcanic plains with a few mountainous areas and impact craters strewn around. Despite having a comparable size, mass, and composition to Earth, Venus is frequently referred to as Earth's twin, despite having a vastly different environment and climate. Venus's rotation is one of its most noticeable features. Venus rotates on its axis in a retrograde motion, which means it spins against the direction of its orbit around the Sun, unlike Earth and the majority of other planets. A Venetian day is longer than its year, which lasts around 225 Earth days, as a complete rotation takes about 243 Earth days. Although the precise reason for Venus's unusual rotation is still unknown, some scientists think that a large collision in the past may have played a role. Venus is quite hot, which is another feature worth mentioning. Venus is the hottest planet in our solar system, hotter even than Mercury, which is closest to the Sun. With surface temperatures that average approximately 900 degrees Fahrenheit, 475 degrees Celsius, the dense carbon dioxide atmosphere's greenhouse effect, which traps the sun's heat, is the main source of this high temperature. This information serves as a sobering reminder of the possible repercussions of unchecked greenhouse gas emissions to us here on Earth. Venus has 90 times more atmospheric pressure than Earth, in addition to being extremely hot. This extreme pressure is comparable to the pressure that exists around 3,000 feet, 914 meters, beneath the surface of the Earth's oceans. The combination of tremendous pressure and temperature on Venus's surface make it a very hostile environment. Let's now quickly go through several characteristics Venus does not share with Earth. First, Venus is assumed to lack a worldwide magnetic field because of its sluggish rotation and potentially an iron core structure. Second, Venus does not appear to have plate tectonics, perhaps as a result of its thick crust and high surface temperature. Venus is a fascinating planet that provides important information on how planets in our solar system create and develop.
we can uncover Venus's enigmatic past and acquire valuable lessons that apply to our own world by comprehending the peculiar features of the planet, such as its retrograde rotation and severe environment. What is the main idea of the lecture? What does the professor mean when this was said? This information serves as a sobering reminder of the possible repercussions of unchecked greenhouse gas emissions to us here on Earth. Why does the professor mention that Venus has no global magnetic field and no evidence of plate tectonics? Why does the professor say? We can uncover Venus's enigmatic past and acquire valuable lessons that apply to our own world by comprehending the peculiar features of the planet, such as its retrograde rotation and severe environment. Which of the following are characteristics of Venus? Sort the following statements as true or false based on the information provided in the lecture. Now listen to the conversation between two people. Hi, I'm working on a research project for my history class, and I could use some help finding sources. Can you assist me? Of course. What's the topic of your research project? I'm researching the impact of the printing press on the dissemination of knowledge in Europe. That's a fascinating topic. I'd recommend starting with our online database which has numerous academic articles and primary sources on the subject. You can access it using your student login credentials. Thank you. I'll definitely look into that. What about books? Are there any key texts I should consider? 
Yes, there are several books on the topic in our library. One important work on this topic can be found in the library. However, that book is currently checked out, and it might not be returned for a couple of weeks. Oh, that's unfortunate. I guess I'll have to find another way to access it. You know, we can request a copy from another library through the interlibrary loan system. It usually takes about a week for the book to arrive. That would be really helpful. Thank you so much for your assistance. You're welcome. Don't hesitate to come back if you have any further questions or need more help. Good luck with your research project. What is the main idea of the dialogue? What does the librarian imply about the book she mentioned? What is the student's attitude when they learn that the book is checked out? How does the librarian help the student to access the book? How can the student access the library's online database? Now listen to the lecture. The study of manipulating and controlling matter at the atomic and molecular levels is known as nanotechnology. Approximately 100,000 times thinner than a human hair, it works with substances smaller than 100 nanometers in size. The potential applications of nanotechnology are limitless and may completely alter how we tackle problems in a variety of fields, the use of nanotechnology in medicine is among its most well-known applications. New materials for regenerative medicine are also being created using nanotechnology, including scaffolds for tissue engineering and wound healing. These developments are anticipated to significantly affect how diseases are treated and the standard of healthcare as a whole. Nanotechnology is enabling the development of more compact, potent electrical devices. Computers, cell phones, and other electronic devices have significantly improved as a result of the development of faster and more energy-efficient CPUs made possible by the shrinking of transistors. In addition, researchers are studying novel nanomaterials like graphene for their special qualities, which may provide cutting-edge and highly effective electronic components. 
Moving on to the environment, nanotechnology has the capacity to offer practical answers to a number of environmental problems. For instance, the use of nanomaterials in water purification systems can aid in the removal of impurities and guarantee that everyone in the globe has access to clean water. Nanotechnology-based solar cell research may also considerably increase the production of renewable energy and contribute to the fight against climate change. However, there are difficulties and worries with nanotechnology, just like with any newly developed technology. The possibility of unanticipated environmental and health effects from the discharge of nanoparticles into the environment is the main cause for concern. It is essential to research these potential concerns and find appropriate policies and responsible innovation to handle them. It is our duty as researchers and innovators to make sure that nanotechnology is developed in a sustainable and safe manner. I personally can't wait to witness the amazing breakthroughs that this industry will produce in the years to come. What is the main idea of the lecture? Why does the professor mention water purification systems? How does the professor feel about the future of nanotechnology? What does the professor mean when he says? It is our duty as researchers and innovators to make sure that nanotechnology is developed in a sustainable and safe manner. Why does the professor talk about the miniaturization of transistors? What is the significance of nanotechnology in the field of medicine?
This part of the test will measure your speaking ability. It will last around 20 to 30 minutes. You will answer four questions. The first question will be about a familiar topic. The other three will be about short conversations, lectures, and reading passages. You can read and hear the lectures and paragraphs only once. You will see the time available for preparing the responses as well as the time to give your response on the bottom side of the screen. You have to stay within those time limits. Speaking Task 1 You will be asked a question about a familiar topic. You will then have 15 seconds to prepare your response and 45 seconds to speak. Many people think that using the public transportation is the best option, but others find that cars are more convenient. Which do you prefer, and why? Include examples and details in your response. Prepare your response after the beep. Start speaking after the beep. Speaking Task 2 You will read a short paragraph and then listen to a conversation between two people. You will have 50 seconds to read the paragraph. After, you will get a question about what you read and heard. You will have 30 seconds to prepare your response and then 60 seconds to give it. You have 50 seconds to read. Start reading after the beep. Now listen to the conversation between two people. What do you think about this new change? It is horrible. I don't know what they were thinking when they made this change. Why do you feel so negative about it? First of all, it will be tougher. The essays allowed us to have far more flexibility with the grades. I mean, it is much easier to get more points on the essays rather than on the exam. It was also easier to get extra credit that way. Now with this change, that is no longer a possibility. Yeah, I guess you are right. But don't you think it will give you more time? That now we only need to focus on the tests? You mean, now we get to be stressed about the tests? Like I said, you had more options before. Now that we know it's all about the tests, we will be anxious about it. Okay, but still, the tests can't be that bad. They can be difficult. The professor likes to put a lot of difficult questions. You really need to learn every detail from the textbook to know that you will get a good grade. I didn't know that. 
I also take issue with what they said about the essays being useless. That is simply not true. We get a lot from essays and presentations. If you really want to get deep into a specific subject, they are the best way to go. You really get to the core that way, and it makes the students invested when you make them research and present something. If there are so many positives to the old way, why change this now? I think it's pure laziness. The professor doesn't want to waste time with grading the essays. It is much easier to just grade the exams, so there will not be that much work. What does the male student think about the new grading system? Include the details he mentions. Prepare your response after the beep. Start speaking after the beep. Speaking Task 3 You will read a short paragraph about an academic topic then listen to a lecture about it. You will have 50 seconds to read the paragraph. After, you will get a question about what you read and heard. You will have 30 seconds to prepare your response and then 60 seconds to give it. You have 50 seconds to read. Start reading after the beep. Now listen to the lecture. When they say that a species is adapting, we mean that it is changing its behavior, body, or both. There is a plethora of species currently living on Earth, and they can be found in all corners of this blue planet. The animal and plant adaptations depend completely on the type of environment they are found in. The Earth has many natural habitats that are spread across large surfaces. We can distinguish three types of adaptations. Number one, the structural adaptations. Basically, here we are talking about the skin, color, and shape of the organism. These adaptations help it survive in its habitat. The beak of a woodpecker is a good example. It became stronger over time to allow this bird to carve out its own home. 
Next are the physiological adaptations. These are the biological mechanism that are developed over time. For example, the snake's ability to produce venom or the mammal's ability to secrete milk for their young. And lastly, we have the behavioral adaptations. Just like it says, it is about the change in the behavior that helps a creature survive. A great example of this is taking care of the young. Some reptiles just lay as many eggs as possible in the hope that some of them will survive predators, but good parenting has proven to be the best way to secure the offspring's entrance into the world. What types of adaptations does the professor mention? Use points and examples from the lecture. Prepare your response after the beep. Start speaking after the beep. You will listen to a lecture about an academic topic. After, you will get a question about what you heard. You will have 20 seconds to prepare your response and then 60 seconds to give it. Now listen to the lecture. When we are talking about nonverbal communication, we are referring to body movements, eye contact, gestures, voice, touch, control of space, through which we are communicating our intentions and attitudes. People are often unaware of their body language, but is it important for us to know what our body is saying or screaming to the world? It most certainly is. There are ways in which you can improve your vocabulary in this areas. Like we mentioned, gestures are part of the nonverbal communication. We often wave our arms about, not thinking about it as we do, making Calm and clear gestures is an indication of a confident person who is free from anxiety. Posture is also really important. By having a straight back and having an open stance, we convey that we are not afraid and that we are confident. What we mean by open stance is that your arms are not in front of your torso. When they are, this is a defensive stance. You are indicating that you are afraid of an attack. Eye contact is among the most intimate forms of communication. Since humans rely so much on the visual aspects, we are especially sensitive about our eyes. They can communicate affection for somebody when we give someone a soft glance. Or they can show hostility if we intensely look into somebody's eyes, waiting for the other person to look away first. We assert our dominance in a relationship with somebody this way. No matter what we are doing in life, whether it is trying to make a love interest fall for us or trying to get that new promotion, we need to be aware of how we carry ourselves. What we say can be of little importance if our body language is saying something different. The amount of success we get in life can be greatly determined by this.
what does the professor say about nonverbal communication, and in which ways do we do it? Include points and examples from the lecture. Prepare your response after the beep. Start speaking after the beep. This part of the test will measure your writing ability in an academic environment. It will last around 30 minutes. You will write two responses. In the first task, which is called an integrated question, you will read a passage and then listen to a lecture. After that, you will answer a question based on what you read and heard. In the second task, which is called an academic discussion question, a professor will ask a question that you need to answer. Writing Task 1, Integrated Question. For this task, you will read a passage, and then hear a lecture about an academic topic. You will have three minutes to read the passage. You may take notes during the reading and the listening. The reading passage will be shown again, during the time when you are supposed to write, but you will listen to the lecture only once. You will have 20 minutes to write your response. Effective responses are usually between 150 to 225 words. You have three minutes to read. Start reading now.
Now listen to the lecture. Firstly, while many celebrate the technological advancements in renewable energy as a harbinger of the Green Revolution, one must also take into consideration the fact that these advancements have plateaued in recent years. Technological improvements have been slower than expected, especially for solar and wind energy. The rate of increase in efficiency for photovoltaic cells and wind turbines has not been as dramatic as predicted. Moreover, larger wind turbines have brought about additional challenges such as increased noise pollution and adverse effects on bird populations, undermining the perceived environmental friendliness. Secondly, regarding governmental policies and market integration, one might argue that the current incentives are not robust enough to facilitate a wholesale shift towards renewables. Governmental policies across the globe are inconsistent, with some countries still heavily reliant on fossil fuels for economic reasons. Additionally, the market mechanisms currently in place, such as feed-in tariffs and green certificates, have proven to be insufficient for the extensive integration of renewable energy into existing grids. The market integration of renewable energy remains an economic challenge that requires more comprehensive solutions. Lastly, the issue of energy storage is a significant hurdle for the renewable energy sector. While there have been advancements in battery technology, the practical implementation of these technologies on a large scale remains far off. Efficient storage solutions for renewable energy are still expensive and resource-intensive. Additionally, the materials needed for these storage systems, like lithium and cobalt, are finite and can cause environmental issues of their own. Summarize the points made in the lecture, being sure to explain how they cast doubt on specific points made in the reading passage. You have 20 minutes to write. Start writing now.
In this task, you will need to answer a question posed by a professor. You will also be able to see how two other students answered it. You will have 10 minutes to write your response. Effective responses will have at least 100 words.
If you find these videos helpful, you can come and support us on Patreon. You can gain access to ad-free content, as well as more tests. Your support is appreciated.